Hi, everyone, and welcome to another session during the Risk Awareness Week 2020. As always, keep it interactive. Write all your questions and comments below this video. Ask a uh, question to our speakers. Talk to other participants. You can really use this opportunity to learn. Don't forget to share on social media. You can share this page and invite your colleagues and friends to watch the replay. And um, don't forget to take a piece of paper and write important comments and, uh, and key messages from this, this workshop because this is gonna be very, very valuable and a, and a completely different take on risk-based decision-making uh, to what many of you are maybe used, for, uh, you, uh, used to. And so today I'm joined by Max Henrion. Uh, Max, can you please tell us a little bit about um, your background? Sure. Um, well, thanks, Alex, for inviting me to this. Um, so I'm currently, and actually for the last uh, decade or two, the CEO at Lumina Decision Systems. And we uh, develop the Analytica software that I think quite a few people in this community are using, um, designed to make it a whole lot easier to build risk models, do uncertainty analysis using influence diagrams. And, um, I first became interested in risk and uncertainty as a student at Carnegie Mellon doing my PhD. And in fact, what I'm going to be talking about today, I'm going back a few decades um, to uh, kind of review and represent and think about uh, the work actually that I did in my PhD thesis, which was entitled The Value of Knowing How Little You Know. Um, and while I was there at Carnegie Mellon, you know, I started developing some tools really just for my own purposes. And then as a professor at Carnegie Mellon in engineering and public policy, uh, working with Granger Morgan, did you know, more and more work in risk analysis and uncertainty and finally decided that we should make this tool available as a commercial product. And then I left academe, sort of, and moved out to Silicon Valley and started up Lumina Decision Systems, um, which is kind of what I've been doing since then. Although I still have, you know, a lot of interest. I'm still adjunct faculty at Carnegie Mellon and uh, with consulting at Stanford, still have a toe in the academic world. That's, that's, that's really good. And uh, we, we have um, more than 3,000 participants from 133 countries um, this year. And to many of them, I mean, you, you'd be surprised, but to many of them, they still think that building any kind of decision models, and I, I, I really want, I kind of, I really uh, encourage everyone who is not a risk professional because we have completely you know, varied uh, audience, decision makers, uh, decision support analysts, risk managers, insurance experts, and internal auditors, uh, to, to most of those people, they still think that building models is only possible in Excel. And uh, cumbersome cells of numbers is the only way to represent information. Well, Analytica kind of really challenges that fundamental assumption that the only way you can build models is building huge tables with formulas in Excel uh, without the graphical uh, interface available to that. So our session today will be interesting kind of on both aspects. It's, it's all about making important decisions under uncertainty, but it's also about using you know, state of the art tools to simplify the decision making. And uh, uh, one of the things, I mean, I've came across Analytica I don't know, maybe five or six years ago. And what, what amazed me is that back in the day and still, still up to now, we still have to have additional software to add Monte Carlo functionality to Excel. But kind of Analytica was built on the premise that you can't really have a model without uncertainty. And uh, most models in Excel are deterministic, uh, which is kind of the, the world we, we almost live in the, in the deterministic world if you kind of look you know, left and right. And Analytica, Analytica challenges that to the very core, saying that, well, we actually live in a stochastic world 
And the only way to look at a uh, prediction of future or any kind of important decision is through a stochastic lens, which, which you know, five years ago, this was kind of you know, groundbreaking to me. So, uh, <laughs> Max. Well, uh, I'm so <laughs> happy to hear you say that, Alex. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, you know, back when I was doing my PhD, which is now, you know, that was started in the late 70s, I thought, you know, I looked around me and I saw, well, all the analysis was deterministic just about. And I thought, well, you know, we could change this. Maybe a better tool, maybe showing why it's important, you know, put out a book, you know, then I can move on to something else with my life. Well, <laughs> as it's turned out, you know, most of the last 40 years I've spent, uh, you know, with a major focus on trying to convince people it's a good idea and practical to deal with uncertainty, as you're saying. And, you know, think, but things do change, as you say, you know, there has been quite a change, but it's still got a little ways to go, shall we say. T totally. And, uh, you know, Risk Awareness Week uh, turns out to be a magnet for people that are trying to create stochastic world for all of us to live and make better decisions. I mean, one of your good friends, Sam Savage, is doing quite a few sessions during this, this year's Indeed. Risk Awareness Week. And, I mean, he's, he, he's been fighting, fighting to make the world more stochastic for the last God knows how many years. Yeah, yeah, it's so interesting. So, you know, Sam and I, you know, knew of each other. We both live here kind of in Silicon Valley, um, but we knew of each other for many years. But the last few years, we finally started working together and really enjoying that on, on real practical projects for large clients. So, um, so, so, so what do you want to talk about today? What do you want to share with our, with our audience? So, well, it's this question of really why should you consider uncertainty? What difference does it make? And, you know, I talk about when to leave for the airport, and I'm going to use that as an example because it's something we're all familiar with, maybe a little bit less familiar in the last few months, perhaps. But, uh, uh, but it's a great example of what difference it makes if you ignore uncertainty or if you consider it in a very intuitive way. So, um, so, I first, uh, well, to start at the very beginning, <laughs> I'm going to start at the, um, with when the world was created, which according to Archbishop Asher in the 17th century, was created on 22nd of October, 404 BC at 6 p.m. Um, and I just always love this quote, you know, the certainty um, with which he figured out the exact time. And it was based on some rather extensive and esoteric calculations based on the Bible and his extensive scholarship. That, that must have been some sophisticated model. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it helps if you can read Latin, which uh, I'm afraid I can't do. But, uh, but, you know, jumping forward a little bit, um, I, as an undergraduate, I studied physics at the University of Cambridge and had a course from this rather intimidating gentleman, Sir Neville Mott. And one of the things that he uh, said was, a number is meaningless without a statement of its uncertainty. And so that kind of, uh, perhaps I didn't realize it at that moment, but you know, a few years later, that actually turns out to be kind of like a mission statement for me. And uh, so, so when is it worth considering uncertainty? And I, you know, I should first acknowledge that it, it takes time and effort, at least it appears to at the beginning, let's say you're used to doing deterministic models as you know, most people that build Excel models as you mentioned probably are or any kind of model. And then it's a bit hard enough building these models. And then you hear from somebody like Alex or Sam or me, okay, you have to estimate the uncertainty in your uncertain quantities, perhaps from data, if you have enough data. You know, often you don't really have the data that you want on key quantities. So you might do expert elicitation asking, you know, domain experts to express their knowledge in the form of probability distribution. That's um, you know, that, that 
there's a whole science on how to do that, but it's not a simple thing. And then you build a probabilistic model. And you know, we like to think that with analytic error makes it a whole lot easier and faster, but it still seems like more work than building a simple deterministic one. And then you do the Monte Carlo simulation, hopefully your tool makes that really straightforward. And then finally, last and definitely not least, you have to explain the results of your uncertain, the uncertainty, uh, the uncertain elements of your analysis to your clients, to the decision makers, and you know, making that clear to them. And many of them you know, don't really understand probability and the notion of using expert judgment seems a little foreign if you're trying to be scientific. So there's educational process. But of course, you know, I think it's all worthwhile. In a certain sense, I'm going to be talking about that. You know, there's a few ob more obvious things. So first of all, treating the uncertainty gives you a much deeper understanding of the problem than assuming everything is going to be, you know, according to your initial best estimate. Or when you start asking about the range of possible futures, um, you get a much more interesting and more useful conversation. And ultimately, you know, I'm a decision analyst. The point is about making better decisions and it does lead to better decisions. And I'm gonna talk some more about that. Um, but, you know, still one needs to ask the question, how often is it gonna give you, uh, lead to better decisions and how much better? And I don't think that has really been asked much. Um, and that's kind of really what I'm going to be focusing on today. Mm -hmm. so, so as I mentioned, I started this out when I was doing my PhD at Carnegie Mellon. Here's a photo of me with my PhD advisor, Granger Morgan, over 40 years ago, you know, using our primitive uh, computer attached to a phone modem. Um, many of you may have no idea what that is, but... Um, some of you will. Um, and Granger and I um, decided we would kind of develop, we, you know, our focus would be to develop techniques for dealing with uncertainty. We did a whole range of expert elicitations, which, um, by the way, this is what we look like today, 40 years later. The odd thing is that, well, you can see I look 40 years older. I've got white hair. Granger looks exactly the same. Um, I don't think we exactly know why that is, but uh, anyway. So, so because we were interviewing these experts, we had to fly around the country together to do the interviews. And Granger's philosophy is you get to the airport well in advance of the plane leaving, um, and you don't have any stress. My philosophy, at least in those days, is a kind of grad student was, you know, you do, I like to spend time in bed if I have an early morning flight. And optimally, I arrive at the airport and run across the airport, get a little exercise and arrive at the gate just when the gate is closing. And as you might imagine, this caused a certain amount of tension between me and Granger. Um, uh, <laughs> he did not appreciate my approach. And at the same time as I was formulating the focus of my PhD thesis on how to deal with uncertainty, I thought, okay, well, maybe there's an interesting decision problem that we can use as an example. And I'm gonna kind of recap what that, what that problem is. Um, and <clears throat> so here is you know, my version of the plane catching decision problem. Here's my home in the Santa Cruz mountains and, um, outside of Silicon Valley, I had a, or when we still used to fly on a regular basis to go, had to meet an important client, um, taking the 8 a.m. plane from San Jose, what time do I need to get up and what time do I need to leave? So, so I had to drive to San Jose airport. Um, and so if I ignore uncertainty, I might say, well, it takes me about 80 minutes median to drive to the airport, park, get to the gate through security if the line isn't too bad. So if I was a truly deterministic 
decision maker, I'd say, okay, well, I'll allow 81 minutes for that. Well, we all know intuitively that that's not such a great decision. If I ignore the uncertainty, I'm probability of missing the plane is about 50%. Um, now, we all know intuitively that that's not a good idea for this problem, but you know, being a decision analyst, I figured, well, we should do the analysis, and figure out, well, what is the optimal time to leave it? And um, so what I'm gonna do now is actually jump into um, uh, our Analytica software and start to build this model, just to kind of give you a sense. So of course, when I was doing my PhD, I didn't have this kind of tool. I had to build some things. Um, and actually the things that I then built have over since then evolved into what Analytica is today. So I always like to start out with the decision, the kind of green rectangle node, uh, time to leave home. And I'm gonna actually do it. It's a number of minutes before the scheduled departure of the plane. Mm -hmm. And my objective is somehow to minimize time wasted hanging around at the airport. So what do I care about? Well, I care about, you know, the total time needed to get to the gate. So I'm just going to say total time needed. Um, draw some arrows to show the influences. Um, those of you that don't know about influence diagrams, they're an extremely handy way, as you'll see here, uh, to, to structure a problem. They're designed by decision analysts um, to initially, when you sit down with your domain experts, perhaps your clients, the decision makers, to figure out what are the things that you actually care about. Obviously, this is a somewhat trivial example, but you know the same process applies. I'm just, okay, what else affects the total time needed? Well, um, uh, time uh, for me to walk from parking to the gate. Mm -hmm. And um, one more thing then, how long do I need to be at the gate uh, to be allowed onto the airplane? Nowadays, that's often about 20 minutes in the US here, but sometimes it's 30 minutes. Uh, okay. And so now I could start to put some numbers, actually distributions in here. So um, I'm gonna uh, put, I've got a little pane here where I can put in the formula or definition here. Um, time to drive to the airport. I'm going to select a probability distribution to put into here to express my uncertainty. Um, I always like the log normal or, um, kind of as a first cut. Um, let's say on average it takes me about uh, 50 minutes to get there and uh, we could put in a geometric standard deviation of let's say one point to five. Um, and in a different talk, we'll explain what that means. But you know, we, you can put in the distributions in whatever you, way you want. Maybe you just want to put in a normal distribution, you can just type that in here. Um, you know, takes a mean of 15 minutes and standard deviation, let's say five minutes. And the time at the gate, um, I'm going to uh, I don't really like triangular distributions, but some people do. So I'm going to put the is in as an example. And as you can see, as you start to type, you can select whatever you want there. So let's say you know, 10, the most likely 15, and could be up to uh, 25. Okay. And the total time needed, we need to have a definition in there. So we'll see that these things that have arrows coming in from them now appear as inputs here. So we're just gonna sum them together. So I select that input, type in plus, select the next input, plus again, and we've just summed them together. So kind of pretty straightforward. Okay, 
time to leave home. Well, I'm going to just start out with one number. Um, you know, I think I said uh, 80 minutes. That's 80 minutes before the plane's due to leave. And you'll see as I put in definitions, this cross hatching goes away to show there's something complete. Now, how do I quantify time wasted? Um, well, it's basically time that I'm sitting at the gate when I could have been snoozing in my comfortable bed. Okay, so, so that is the difference between the um, total uh, time that I leave for it um, minus the total time that I actually need. Mm -hmm. Now, there's sort of something missing here, which is like, well, what if I miss this plane? That would not be good. Okay, so I'm going to type in um, a conditional statement. If the total time needed um, <clears throat> is greater than the time that I've allowed, I can also click on this node to just put that directly into the formula here. That's kind of often, you know, if the total time needed is greater than the time I've allowed, then, um, you know, I'm going to call this the miss loss. I, the loss that I experience for missing a plane mm -hmm. is zero. So I've got a simple conditional expression here. Um, and, you know, it's noticing that I've got this variable miss loss, which is already highlighted in red. Um, so that's fine. I'm just going to tell it to create the variable. Okay. So it's, it's um, made the variable for me. And I'm going to say, well, that's uncertain. This is kind of how much time will it cost me if I actually miss this plane and, you know, perhaps miss the meeting with the client. Mm -hmm. You know, um, this is all about kind of expressing my loss here. I'm going to just put in a <clears throat> quick uh, log normal with... Um, let's say it's 400 minutes, I can get another plane later in the day, but it will be aggravating for everybody concerned, um, and so on. So, and by the way, you see it turned into a oval node. Oval nodes in decision and in influence diagrams mean um, uncertain quantities. Mm. And now we can just see, well, how much time am I going to waste? Okay, well, uh, 398 minutes. Really? Um, well, when I first look at it, it's doing a mid value, which is doing a deterministic analysis using the median of each of the uncertain inputs. Okay, well, I would rather look at maybe the probability density function. Ah, interesting. It's kind of got this, you know, two hum, two peak look to it. Well, you know, why is that? Well, because the you know, either I missed the plane, which this is, I have this uncertain uh, time wasted, which is around 400, or I don't, in which case is a much smaller. Mm -hmm. But actually, what I care about is making this decision. Why am I assuming it's 80 minutes? And, and by the way, I might, I, I, I could say, well, what's the probability that I'll miss? And that's really, um, we can just say the probability that this quantity uh, uh, let, me, let, me, let me head on here. So, um, so the, t the decision here, you know, that's the interesting part. You know, there's no point in doing an analysis if you don't have a decision. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying 80, I'm going to put in a list of alternative options. You know, what if I only allow, you know, 50 or, or 55 and all the way up to, let's say, um, 150 minutes. Okay. So then we can start to look at our time wasted. And you'll notice that, that um, and let's look at the mid value first. And so this mid being deterministic. So what we see here is that 
Um, if I leave 85 minutes, I'm going to catch the plane, so that's great. If I leave it 80 minutes, I'm going to miss it, so I lose 400 minutes. That's a disaster. So mm -hmm. if I'm Mr. Deterministic, I'm going to say 85 minutes. If I leave longer than that, I'm going to lose, I'm going to waste a little time when I could have been snoozing in bed because, you know, all this extra time. Or if I have less time, the slope goes down a little bit because at least I get some extra minutes in bed, but I, of course, yeah. still... So, so for, for our good. audience, but, let's just explain this graph a little bit. Yes. Um, Mm -hmm. So time wasted against uh, time to leave home. So yes, if we, if we, what, what is this saying to us? If we leave less than eighty-five minutes, then we're going to waste a lot of time. And if we leave uh, earlier than eighty-five minutes, then uh, we will waste time, but it's significantly less than missing a plane. So basically, anything below eighty-five minutes. Uh, we will likely miss the plane and hence would waste a lot of time. Right. right. Now, now, here we're doing the deterministic analysis, but instead let's look at the expected time or mean value of time wasted doing the Monte Carlo analysis for all those quantities. And it's pretty instant here. Um, and so what we kind of see is that uncertainty is in a certain sense smoothed out this mm -hmm. curve. And now, if we want to minimize the mean value or the expected time wasted, we look at this curve and it now says, okay, maybe around 115 minutes would be optimal. Um, so that, that, that's interesting. So deterministic model, ignoring all of the uncertainty, tells us you better leave 85 minutes in advance of your plane. But just adding the uncertainty tells us that you should probably leave at least 115 minutes before the plane. Yes, and, and I'm now going to a model, version of this model that has a few more things in it, but it's basically the same model. We created a user interface. There's some more analysis inside this module. You can organize an analytic, a, you know, complex model that may have hundreds or thousands of variables into a hierarchy of modules. And I'm just going to quickly, you know, so here we can look at the loss, you know, compare the shark's tooth version, ignoring uncertainty, uh -huh. and the smooth version with uncertainty. And, you know, we can also do things like, you know, tornado diagrams to see how important each of these uncertainties is mm -hmm. to the thing I care about, you know, minimizing time wasted. Um, and Actually, that's a function of when I leave, um, which is sort of interesting. If I, if I leave um, a small amount of time, then, then actually what, it becomes more important. Um, to to uh, run faster. Was. Yeah. And so, so in any kind of modeling, but especially with uncertainty, it's the sensitivity analysis, the exploration of the parametric analysis, which is what gives you the insights. And, um, you know, we designed Analytica to make it really easy to do all kinds of different sensitivity analysis, importance analysis, which is kind of a <clears throat> uh, rank order correlation is often a good technique for uncertainty. Again, kind of depends uh, on your decision or we can select that decision and we see how the sensitivity of each of these for uncertain quantities varies as a function of our decision. Um, the thing I wanted to kind of talk about here is this concept of the value of uh, un uh, ignoring uncertainty. And it says, well, the best time to leave is 110 minutes uh, if I'm considering uncertainty versus 80 minutes if I don't. And the expected value of including uncertainty is 30 minutes. Now, I'm going to explain that in a little more with a slide, because um, that's kind of the crucial kind of technical part of the talk. Um, and so again, here's our shark's tooth graph. Vertical axis is 
time wasted, our objective we're trying to minimize, and our decision is a horizontal axis. And <clears throat> our optimal decision ignoring uncertainty is 80 minutes. Okay, then we put in the probabilistic analysis and we see the optimal decision minimizing that expected time wasted is, well, in this case, uh, under 110 minutes. And the, if we make our decision ignoring uncertainty of 80 minutes or 81, let's say, our expected loss is where 80 crosses this green line. So it's about 225 minutes. You know, intuitively we know it's a lousy decision, but for other things we might, we complex problems, we might not realize this. And then this bottom line is the expected loss if we consider uncertainty, you know, basically where this green line is. So we have a bit of a loss that is time. Most likely I'm going to spend some time at the gate when I could have been snoozing, but it's not, you know, it looks like it's about 30 minutes. Now, the difference between those lines is the extra value that I get from considering uncertainty, which I call the expected value of including uncertainty. And it turns out that this quantity is, um, you know, it depends on your decision problem. If you don't have a decision, then, you know, why are you bothering to do anything? But if you have a decision, this is a good reason to deal with uncertainty. And, um, so, so we define the EVIU as the expect, as in general, the ex increase in expected value due to choosing the Bayes decision versus um, that, which is the name statisticians give to the decision that maximizes expected value over the uncertain quantities relative to a deterministically optimal decision that maximizes value, ignoring uncertainty. In this case, we kind of assume ignoring uncertainty means using the median of each uncertain quantity. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the mean, you know, not, not totally clear, but that doesn't make a big difference. And we can compare the EVIU to the expected value of perfect information that may be more familiar to those of you that have studied decision analysis at least, that's kind of how much better a decision can you make on the average if you were able to learn the true values of all the uncertain quantities. So the EVIU is not giving you more information, but it's about making your decision considering, being explicitly modeling the uncertainties versus ignoring them. And it, so we call this, this the Socratic ratio. Um, and sometimes it's less than one, sometimes it's greater than one. That is to say, the loss of value of ignoring uncertainty is even worse than the value you would get if you found out the values for real. And sometimes it's less. I call it the Socratic ratio after Socrates, who famously said, if I'm thought wise, it's only because I know that I know nothing. And apparently he irritated a lot of his fellow citizens of Athens by saying that. <laughs> um, so the, the thing coming out of this analysis is that it turns out that it's symmetry in the value function that, or asymmetry that affects this. And a lot of real decisions, perhaps even most, have that. So, I mean, if you're designing a bridge, how thick should the steel trusses be or for a suspension bridge? Well, you know, as thin as possible because it's expensive to have thick ones, except that obviously at some point there's a risk of breaking. So you don't want to go down that road. You know, engineers typically use a rule of thumb for these things. They don't do this kind of probabilistic analysis, but maybe they should. I think they might learn some things. Um, or some, we get a lot of times involved with power companies, um, for example, sizing the capacity of their generators. You know, um, 
in the US at least, they kind of like to think that they have enough capacity. You know, just a month ago, California had to do load shedding because there was not enough capacity to meet peak demand. And I know in other parts of the world, that's not uncommon. Um, but that is a decision making under uncertainty. And it's asymmetric because typically each additional megawatt of generation that you have to put in has some significant cost to make it available to build it. And then if you don't have enough capacity and you can't, you have to do load shedding, then there's a different cost of loss, both for the power company and for their customers. And um, because those things uh, are asymmetric, it's a, an ex example where treating the uncertainty explicitly is really important. Uh, from what I've seen, most utilities don't do a very good job of this, um, although they certainly, this is a problem that they care about a whole lot. And then, you know, more timely, perhaps, you know, I'm sure many of the people that have been, you know, into probabilistic modeling and so on have been looking at some of the epidemiology models. And for those <laughs> members of the public not so familiar with the concept of ex exponential growth, we've all had a crash course in the meaning of that. And one of the implications is that let's say you're trying to figure out, is there an outbreak happening in your community? Should we start social distancing? Should we have a lockdown that's going to impact our economy? When should we start that? And because of the exponential growth, if you're a week late, that, you know, you have the, 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 the um, epidemic in your community could affect, you know, 10 times more people, maybe even 100 times more people than if you're a week early. Um, and it's another example of a highly asymmetric decision where the uh, loss function, where when you make that decision is incredibly sensitive. And also one in which if you were doing a decision analysis here, and I only wish more people were, considering the uncertainty, it strongly pushes you to making an earlier decision. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even if you aren't a decision analyst, you can see the countries that have made earlier decisions have been on the whole much more successful. Um, so summary, you know, when is it worth considering uncertainty? Kind of take two. You know, one way to talk about it is when your value function or your loss function, same thing, but, you know, one is minus the other, when they're asymmetric and uncertain quantity. Um, and, you know, I know, for example, Sam Savage, his beautiful book on the floor of averages gives a few examples like the drunk talking or walking down the middle of a road, you know, <laughs> On the average, he's alive, but since his random walk goes off in various directions, he's dead. That's kind of a, <laughs> an example. If you're risk averse, if you're combining uncertain information from multiple sources, you'd like to know the uncertainty to know how to weight those sources. Mm -hmm. If you're making a decision about whether it's worth paying for more information to reduce the uncertainty, you know, obviously you need to think about, well, what is the uncertainty? if you're using the uncertainty for sensitivity analysis to guide model refinement. And this is actually kind of interesting because, you know, my first version of this slide was saying, well, okay, we have to admit it's going to take more effort to build your model treating uncertainty. Now, I would argue that actually that isn't true. I mean, my experience is if you start out with a simple model, assess uncertainty for kind of the parameters you think are going to be most relevant, do the sensitivity analysis, find out what matters, and then use that to guide your model refinement. You're going to end up with a model that focuses on the quantities that make the most difference to your decision. And 
you may end up even with a smaller model. I mean, often people put all our effort into modeling things that they have lots of data on. You know, it's kind of like the drunk looking for the key under the light rather than where he dropped it. Yeah. And so what I find is start simple, do uncertainty analysis, do sensitivity analysis, use that to guide your model refinement. You may end up with a model that's actually simpler because you find that all the exhaustive data analysis of data that's not really that relevant is kind of a waste of time. And then, you know, a more subtler point is that when you look at the uncertainty, a deeper examination of possible futures, you know, asking your experts, well, that's your best estimate, but, you know, what could happen? What is the worst that could happen or the best that could happen? You're going to get a much more interesting conversation and hopefully a much more useful and reliable and resilient model and robust decision. And then finally, um, I would argue that as risk analysts, we sort of have an ethical responsibility to clarify the limits of our uncertainty. And if we put out one number, um, when really there's quite a wide range of numbers, you know, in the short term, our client might be like, well, can't you tell me more accurately? Yep. But in the long term, your clients are going to realize, well, you're being honest. And the other guy who gives you one number, like, you know, Archbishop Usher, is not necessarily the guy that we want to hire for our analysis next time. So long run, Very true. we have a sort of educational process. Alex, yeah. Did you have um, a most of the time when I did um, stochastic you know, risk analysis and stochastic decision models, it's the range of uncertainty that contains more value than the kind of than the mean or the median. It's the, yes. the, the shape of the distribution that communicates more important information. And the tornado, di you know, tornado diagram communicates more around next steps and you know, success, the importance of um, actions to improve success of the decision than uh, the median or, or the mean number. It, it's the, you know, uncertainty is kind of this gray fog surrounding decision models. And if you just look behind the fog, there's just so much valuable information there. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So just, um, you know, obviously I've only been able to touch on some of this, but if you're interested in finding out more, um, this book that I wrote with Granger on uncertainty, Certainty and Risk Analysis um, has a whole chapter on EVIU and, of course, a lot of other stuff on treating uncertainty and risk analysis. Um, we're making, uh, uh, providing a discount on the book for anybody that wants to contact um, uh, Alex or, or us about this um, for the raw meeting. Um, if you want to learn more about the Analytica tool, and obviously I only showed a very simple example, but it's you know, a very powerful tool being used for kind of very large applications. We're offering a free three month subscription for Analytica Professional for participants in the meeting uh, and 50% off for a full year subscription um, uh, and then a random draw for the Analytica Enterprise. And uh, you'll get an email about that. You could also email me. A, or Jeffrey here, but I think you'll get stuff fr from Raw about that. And then finally, I wanted to do a shout out to some other talks here at Raw 2020 that are on overlapping materials. Certainly Sam Savage's talk, um, Torsten Rohner uh, is talking about applications using Analytica and risk analysis. Um, as is Rob Brown, and I think Eng Wee also uses influence diagrams and is a big user of Analytica, um, and you could see, you know, strongly recommend those talks as other ways to learn a little bit more about this. So just a kind of final slide, a cautionary note. Yeah. So this is a painting of the death of Socrates. Um, and as you might remember, um, you know, well, he said, if I'm thought wise, it's only because I know that I know nothing. He's kind of the patron saint of those of us that think we should talk more about uncertainty 
Um, and but you know his <coughs> fellow Athenians did not really appreciate the implication that you know <laughs> they also know nothing and they don't even have the wisdom to admit it. So um, they ultimately asked and sentenced him to death, and here he is drinking the hemlock as a result. Hopefully, in the modern era, uh, the penalty is not so severe. And in fact, what I've found, and I think Alex and others, is that actually, as you start to talk about it, people are saying nowadays, yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. Uh, we should uh, acknowledge and address it in our analysis and our risk analysis. Uh, so I think we've made a little bit of progress since uh, uh, in the last 2,400 years, let's say. So, it, it, thank you, Alex. It, it, for the... for, th thank you, Max, so much for this wonderful presentation and for sharing it with us. Little, and for giving the opportunity to all the participants to use Analytica um, for a limited uh, period for free. I mean, do do try it. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's like building any financial model, but graphically with drag and drop and very intuitive interface. Um, so it's absolutely great. And make sure you watch other sessions during the Risk Awareness Week because quite a few people are going to touch on and show application of, uh, of Analytica. Um, yeah, this is kind of, this is just an indication of what a different world risk management tool is because to most of our audience, uh, the even existence of Analytica would be completely new. But yet this is how many people have been using stochastic, have been making stochastic decisions for years and years. And uh, um, what really amazes me is uh, that if you switch on the news or literally read any um, article on the, uh, on the economy, the kind of the overall theme uh, throughout the publications, the conversations is that the world is getting more uncertain and it's more unpredictable, more volatile. More, uh, and you know, this, uh, this, this kind of this general idea of uncertainty is everywhere is ever present. And yet we continue to make decisions deterministically. We continue to plan deterministically. We can keep, continue to set deterministic performance targets. We continue to measure performance and judge people using deterministic models. And that is just completely mind blowing to me. It's, 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 it's insane. We claim that the world is uncertain. And then literally the very same second, we go, okay, it is uncertain but let's ignore all of that uncertainty and pretend we can guess the future. And then let's believe in our kind of, you know, this fairy tale uh, ba base case that we just came up with and, and not account for all of this volatility in different assumptions that we make. Um, I, I just, I, I find this bizarre and I sincerely hope work by people like Max and uh, Lumina Decision and uh, Risk Awareness Week uh, will kind of start challenging that per perception of the world. Because if the world is uncertain, then we should be able to account and measure and consider this uncertainty. And the good news is we have all the tools available to do it and we have the competency to do it as well. Max, any, any final final? Thanks thoughts? so much, Alex. Uh <laughs> All right, it's thanks, really Max. It's a pleasure to, to do this with you, and uh, you're doing an amazing job in getting the word out in this way. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Max. Uh, everyone, make sure you ask questions, talk to one another, and uh, follow all, all, of the, uh, all of the links that Max uh, has shared. Thanks, everyone, and uh, I'll see you in the other workshop.